Good afternoon. On behalf of the Board of Directors of ICSW, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome all of you to this afternoon and evening event, which begins a year-long observation of ICSW, uh, year-long year celebration rather, of ICSW's 40-year history. Today, you'll have the opportunity to meet and hear from some of the many people who have been and are part of ICSW past and present. You'll have a chance to hear directly from them about the kernel of an idea that grew into the ICSW we know today. You'll be hearing from many of us who have been steeped in the values and importance of psychodynamic theory, practice, and research. What a 40-year journey it has been. We've weathered strong periods, challenging times. We've accomplished much. Let us come together to joyfully honor our past, celebrate our present, and prepare for our future. And so moving on to the Founders Panel, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to five of the founding members of ICSW. These are the founding mothers and fathers of ICSW, the visionaries who started with the seed of an idea and worked to develop it, nourish it, and implement their ideas. They will be telling you much more about the journey. I will introduce them and then they will tell you more about themselves and speak on topics that will give you a fuller picture of ICSW at the beginning and their future visions. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Joe Palumbo, Louise Salzman, Ellen Kenamore, Connie Goldberg, and Tom Kenamore. Take it away. Joe? Thank you. As founding dean, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to celebrate this joyous event. When we first started our institute, I never imagined that we would be at the point we have now. I would first like to begin, though, on behalf of our founding members to express my deep appreciation to our president, Michelle Curtin Stewart, for the effort and work that has gone into organizing this 40th anniversary. Thank you, Michelle. And now I want to start with the story, the story of the birth of ICSW. On Tuesday, June 19th, 1979, I will repeat that, Tuesday, June 19, 1979, let your memories go back to that date. My colleague Arnie Levin and I met accidentally at the corner of Randolph Street and Michigan Avenue. We began discussing our concerns about the lack of an advanced degree in clinical social work. We knew of the efforts of the Clinical Society in California that had started a clinical social work degree there, granting the PhD, and of um, uh, the PhD granted by Smith's College School of Social Work. Those two were the only two PhDs in clinical social works in the Midwest, we did not have one. And so we decided that we needed to do something about it. Shortly after that, we met and drew up a list of prominent social work practitioners who would form a committee to create an, such an institution. Among the people we chose, I will begin first by honoring the memories of those who are not with us today. First is Arnie Levin, who was to become the president of the Institute. He was the founding president of the Illinois Society for Clinical Social Work. And I believe he was also 
instrumental in founding what was then called the Federation of Clinical Social Workers, a national organization. And he was among the first to be in private practice. Next was James Forkiotis. Jim was a professor of, at the School of Social Work at the University of Illinois in Circle Campus. We then chose Janet Corman, who was a lecturer at the, school, so at the School of Social Service Administration at the University of Chicago. And we chose Helen Lane, professor at the School of Social Work at Loyola University. We therefore covered all the major educational institutions that offered social work programs at the time. We then chose two people who were major forces in agencies in the community. Carl Bartolucci, who was the director of the Fillmore Center of Mental Health, and Richard Calica, who was the director of the Juvenile Protective Association. And then two private practitioners, Paul Risen and Art Dears, who was associated with NASW. Having called the committee together, I want to summarize now uh, the work of the, of the history of the Institute. Uh, the panelists will then fill in much of the detail of how we began and what we did. The founding group, which began planning the Institute in 1979, was incorporated in 1981. We applied and were granted permission to begin operation for a doctoral program in clinical social work by the Illinois Board of Higher Education in 1983. Classes then began after approval by the Board of Higher Education. Then the Institute was granted permission to offer a PhD program in clinical social work by the Illinois Board in 1985. That was a necessary step for us to be able to grant the PhD. Having done that, we then applied to the Commission on Institutions of Higher Learning of the North Central Association in 1986. This was the first effort to obtain accreditation status. The Institute completed its first self-study and comprehensive evaluation and was granted candidacy, not full accreditation, in 1988. Finally, in 1993, 14 years after the date we first began, the Institute was granted full accreditation status. I will now turn to the other panelists to fill in the details of the history as we began. Thank you, Joe. Um, Louise Salzman, I'd like to introduce her, and she will be talking on the higher education climate surrounding social work and psychodynamic graduate education in the late 1970s, and also speak to why a PhD program in clinical social work rather than a certificate program. Louise? Okay. I... Thank you all for inviting us today. Uh, the education climate surrounding social work in Chicago came from two traditions. One tradition goes back to Hull House and its women who taught at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, SSA. And the other tradition was that of psychiatric social work, which later was called clinical social work. The psychiatric social worker was part of a team led by a psychiatrist. In the United States, psychoanalytic and psychodynamic theory was the province of the medical profession. Uh, but the profession was willing to teach it to social workers and other non-medical professions. 
Thus, most of ICSW's founders had been able to uh, obtain good psychodynamic therapy training, but it became apparent in the 1970s that clinical social workers were seriously limited by not having doctorates. They were limited both in not being able to access insurance, but also in status and authority, not being able to develop as an independent profession. We no longer wanted to be second on a team. And for an example, uh, we thought it totally unnecessary that social agencies hire medically trained psychiatrists to consult with their staff about social and emotional issues. I was a graduate of the Institute for Psychoanalysis Child Therapy Program and tried with my fellow graduates to have it become a doctor program. But the Psychoanalytic Institute would not allow this. Apparently, they did not wish us as competitors. Then at Michael Reese Hospital Psychiatric Clinic, where I directed social work training, the chief, Dr. Roy Grinker, was very supportive of social work. And we developed an advanced training program in psychodynamic therapy. We were able to arrange with SSA uh, at University of Chicago that our program serve as the internship for some of their PhD students. But we found that SSA did not value the education we were giving our students since uh, SSA was not as clinically oriented. Therefore, when Joe called me to ask me to join with this group, hoping to develop an independent doctoral program, I was delighted. I hoped it would give my profession the strength and status it deserved. And it has lived up to my hopes. Thank you, Louise. Um, Ellen Kenamore will be our next speaker. And Ellen is going to tell us about the professional field of social work as it was defined in the late 1970s and discuss the process of licensure for social workers during that period in the late 1970s. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Freddie. Um, and I, I wanna say what an honor and a privilege it is to be here today. Um, and I wanna thank all of my esteemed colleagues. And I also just wanna give a shout out to all those first students who were so courageous and took the plunge and had the confidence in us and what we were trying to do before we were um, granted, before we were accredited. And um, we were all pioneers together, I think. And um, I'm really grateful to all of you. Um, the more I've been thinking about the issue um, of licensure in the state of Illinois and the status of social work, clinical social work, um, and the relationship of licensure and third party reimbursement, which I think is its close cousin, the more I recall how many of the founding board members were involved in that endeavor. Um, three of the founders had been or were presidents of the Illinois Society for Clinical Social Work. And as Joe said, um, Arnie was a founding, uh, I mean, he was the first president of the Illinois Society. Um, many others had board positions in the society. And I think almost everyone was involved in one way or another with the continuing ed programs the society had offered in the late 70s and um, 80s. The bonds between the Institute and the society, I think, were really strong um, and grew out of a similar perspective. A little background, however, um, to add to what I think Louise was saying, I think um, that clinical social work did grow out of casework practice, and out of that came the psychiatric, you know, psychiatric social workers and then clinical social workers. 
Um, but during the late 60s and early 70s, um, the psychoanalytic and psychodynamic underpinnings um, were under attack. And nothing new, there was conflict within the profession between the more psychodynamic and individual-based approach and a more systemic view that included poverty, basic human needs, oppression, and racism. Needless to say, these approaches weren't and aren't mutually exclusive. And I think the challenge in the profession and for us clinical social workers is to balance those forces and their impact on each other and what is more prevalent in one moment or another to the clients we serve. Um, jumping, still being in the 70s, um, I want to tell you, uh, read to you a statement by um, the Registry of Clinical Social Workers um, who are defined, clinical social workers at that time were defined by their level of education and clinical experience and were qualified to practice autonomously to provide diagnostic, preventive, and treatment services to individuals, families, and groups where functioning is threatened by social and psychological stress or impairment. I know that is a mouthful. And I know where we sit now in, in 2021, it's hard to imagine um, that being independent on autonomous wasn't a widely held given, even though many people at that point were in private practice and working independently in agency settings. Um, I think for us to be recognized as mental health professionals who could practice independently, supervise and train emerging clinicians, be licensed and be eligible to receive insurance reimbursement were all part of the clinical social workers coming of age. It became really clear that political action was necessary to get licensure. And in 1971, a bill was introduced into the Illinois state legislature that would have required insurance companies make payments to clinical psychologists, but not to clinical social workers. The bill died in committee over a fight to give clinical social workers equal protection. Thus, the Illinois Society for Clinical Social Work was formed that year in large part as a reaction to, to um, what happened in 1971. And there was this movement across the country and the Federation of Societies for Clinical Social Work, which Joe referred to earlier, was also formed that year. There were six founding members. The, Illinois was one of them. California and New York are no surprise. This may surprise you a little. Kentucky, Louisiana, and Texas were the other three founding members of, this, of the National Federation. By the mid 80s, I think the society had established a political action committee, hired a very part-time lobbyist consultant to bolster its legislative committee, worked with NAS NASW collaboratively in this endeavor, traveled to Springfield, met with state reps and senators, attended fundraisers, et cetera. During that time, I was chair of the Legislative Committee of the Illinois Society for Clinical Social Work and um, chair of their Political Action Committee. The road to licensure was a long, tedious, and at moments overwhelmingly frustrating uphill battle involving much strategizing, starts and stops, bills not getting out of committee, resistance from psychologists, psychiatrists, and the AMA. Finally, in 1990, after having achieved licensure, the Illinois Insurance Code was changed to include reimbursement to licensed clinical social workers. So this was a 19 year endeavor. <laughs> um, and in retrospect, um, I think that there was a real synergy between the passion the founders of the Institute had and the fight for licensure and third-party reimbursement. Our commitment, I believe, to the highest standards in clinical social work practice 
in order to provide, to provide the best possible services um, our clients deserved were a guiding principle to all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Owen, for that very full and interesting history. Um, now I'd like to introduce and welcome Connie Goldberg, who will tell us about the organization of committees of uh, the ICSW beginnings and how they did their work. Um, the discussions about weekend format for the program and how that came to be and uh, the application process for the Board of Higher Education certification accreditation. Thank you, Connie. Thanks to all of you and to all of you who have given wonderful summaries of uh, the areas you've been covering. Very interesting to me. And of course, thanks always to Joe for uh, including me in this founders group. Uh, it became, of course, a, uh, a founding sense of who I was uh, as a person and as a clinician. Uh, and I'm always grateful to be able to say that this was a part of, um, that I was a part of this uh, marvelous <laughs> group. Uh, let me say a couple of brief things. One of them is that um, we did, as we met uh, the 12 of us in the basement of the Pittsfield building for uh, Saturday upon Saturday, rain or shine, uh, we did decide to follow the um, the format that had been established basically by the Institute for Psychoanalysis with regard to teaching and classes, which was this, that we would um, have our institute uh, have classes every other weekend, and that would allow uh, students to have their private practice or their clinical practice, whatever uh, form it took, during the week and then enable them to come to classes at, uh, on the weekends. That was extremely important because we understood that our students could not simply be full-time students. They needed also to be involved in their clinical work. So we did adopt that pattern. And it, it's interesting that it, it remains in many ways uh, a pattern that makes a lot of sense. Also because we were able to have people travel some distance and those of you who were students early on remember that we had people coming every other weekend from Maine, from some island off of Florida, I can't think of the name of it, from Oregon, from Washington. We had people, this was before the internet, so we had people coming in physically. And when I think about what that meant in their lives, uh, it, it's astounding to me. The, the sacrifice that was involved and their determination uh, to be a part of this institute, with, which at any point was a bit experimental. Uh, let me also say that uh, in, in the beginning, we began dividing ourselves into some working groups. The two major working groups were one called the governance committee, the other having to do with uh, curriculum and faculty matters. I was on the governance committee, which was headed by Arnie Levin. Richard Calico was on it. Um, there were others who came and went who were on it. What happened was we met every other Thursday at noontime and we began to develop the bylaws for the Institute, which really initially struck me as one of the more uh, tedious things that we could be doing. And indeed it was, but it was extremely interesting. We gathered together bylaws from other institutions. We tried to find something that would be reflective of what we were doing as a group. So out of that project grew then our, the evident need that we had to apply to the Illinois uh, Commission on Higher Education in order to obtain what is called operating authority. So that committee and others associated, and Joe, of course, began the work of being responsive to the requirements of the Illinois Board of Higher Education in order for us to open our doors. This was not certificate, it was not anything to do with what we would need to do later. 
Uh, but this was simply to say, okay, you're a school and you can operate. So a group of us went twice to Springfield to plead our cause. And um, after the first hearing, we were turned down. And the issue had to do with things we needed to work more on, on the curriculum, which didn't seem sound enough to them. We needed to make clear who we would be hiring as faculty, what their qualifications would be, would be and so on. Okay. We failed the first round, they told us what to do. We went back the second time to Springfield. And again, they said, well, okay, this is, you've done this well. However, there's one other thing and it's very important. The other thing was they wanted us to accumulate enough funds to put in an escrow account so that if we opened and we admitted students, if we failed, we would have sufficient financial resources to see that those students could make their way through our, our program. This was a, a really overwhelming task in many ways. I, at this point, do not know the exact amount of money that was involved. Joe may know, but I know that to all of us, it was overwhelming. Everyone <laughs> put their shoulder to the wheel to try to figure out who did we know who could help us and <laughs> one way or another, by virtue of some members of the faculty, by virtue especially of new members of the board whom we were developing to come on board with us. Somehow the money was assembled and it was placed in escrow. And so we said, okay, we're going to now appear for the third time. We went this time to Chicago to the meeting of the, in the law firm of the lawyers who were part of this Board of Higher Education. We went on a really dismal, I think um, uh, November afternoon, it was dark and raining and miserable. And I remember standing next to Richard Callick as we were to go into a very fancy um, meeting room of this group. And Richard turned to me and he said, Constance, we are not going to do this again. <laughs> and I knew when he said Constance, I thought, oh my goodness, this is serious. And I said, no, we aren't, Richard, this is it. So we went in and four or five, six of us from the Institute and from the nascent board membership that we had sat on one side of this huge table and the three lawyers sat on the other side. And we sat down and it was cold and dark and dismal. And the head of it said, all right, we're coming to order. And he said, I, we give up. And we, we were just stunned. We had no idea what he meant. He said, we give up. You have met all of our requirements with regard to curriculum, with regard to faculty. You have put in escrow the funds we have asked. There's nothing more we can ask of you, except you understand that you're going to fail. And we were just stunned. None of us really said anything at this point. And he said, the reason that you're going to fail is that no faculty will work for what you're going to pay them. And that's why you're going to fail. And then he said, with still with our being enormously stunned, he said, however, we want you to go out of here to give it a try and to prove us wrong. And so we left there and we proved them wrong. So that's how we got to that. What a wonderful story. Thank you. Um, Tom Kenamore is going to tell us about all of the organizational logistics of starting a PhD program, how the curriculum was developed, the faculty recruited, the funding secured, and much more. Thank you, Tom. All right, I think I will not focus on the, what, the first part of what you described and talk about the much more <laughs> because that's really getting into the weeds. Um, we, as, as has been suggested, we uh, wanted to start a program 
uh, that cl clinical social workers could attend uh, to advance their knowledge and skill and to achieve an advanced credential. And that also one that was coherent um, and within the clinical social works values and mission. Um, there, were, there were limited opportunities for uh, social workers who were cl clinical with a master's degree to uh, advance. Uh, there were, there was the Institute for Psychoanalysis had some courses. There was a range of continuing ed courses as we have now, uh, and programs run by NASW, psychology and other professional training, uh, the family therapy program. In, uh, so um, part of what drove us was the, the recognized need to have an advanced uh, training, education and credentialing uh, program. Um, I my memory of it is that it was organized around two factors, one internal and one ex external. The internal one um, was uh, what kind of a degree to have. Uh, there were the, the founding uh, group was made up of ex extremely uh, skilled and advanced uh, clinical folks and um, some folks with uh, doctoral degrees or who were getting their doctoral degrees. And one of the arguments that went on for some time in that, those initial days when we were figuring out how to put on a play, um, the, um, whether to, to have a clinical uh, doctorate, a PhD, or a clinical doctorate or a certificate program. Um, so the big challenge for that, that was uh, on the, on one hand was to, um, how to incorporate a strong research component into the plan. Um, the other um, was, uh, did we have the research expertise to pull it off? Uh, would a PhD program appeal to clinicians who wanted to advance? Um, ultimately, the PhD idea won out. Um, the argument that won us over was that the PhD would set us apart from other advanced clinical training opportunities. Uh, graduates would have an advanced clinical skill and research skill, um, and the hope that having a research component would make the Institute a center for clinical research, which we recognized was badly needed. The external factor that organized us, uh, as uh, Connie and others have already mentioned, was the issue of accreditation. Uh, what was called the North Central Association, or that is now called the Commission on Higher Le Learning, I believe, uh, was the accrediting body. Uh, Council on Social Worker Education uh, would not accredit a program such as ours because uh, we were not attached to a, an accredited university. And those were, and I think still are the rules for CSWE accreditation. So a natural route we would have taken would have been CSWE, but, um, but uh, we, were, we, we were directed to the Higher Education Commission. Um, there was a time that we considered affiliating with Loyola University Chicago. Um, uh, but we discovered after lots of back and forth negotiation, they were interested in us coming into their program and they're taking us over. And uh, as they were developing their own doctorate, um, we were committed to our independence. Um, the North Central uh, uh, Association questioned why, um, why we were not, why we were uh, trying to get accredited for with the PhD program, given how, how we described ourselves, but we persevered and achieved the accreditation. Um, one of the strong critics uh, on the accreditation team, whose name is Katie Mari, uh, after criticizing us for having a PhD program, became a board member. Um, so we won her over. <laughs> um, all I want to say about the curriculum and how it was organized was that we needed to have a strong clinical uh, psychoanalytic or, and psychodynamic focus uh, education and training. That was not a problem. 
Um, and we also needed a traditional research focus. We ended up emphasizing qualitative research as it is somewhat compatible with uh, clinical practice uh, in its, in its uh, methodology and um, requiring a di dissertation. Uh, another factor which Connie mentioned is to organize it as a weekend uh, course schedule so people could, who are working full time could, uh, could come. Faculty were recruited from the Chicago area based on uh, professional networks and, uh, that the founders had. Um, uh, funding, uh, I was asked to mention funding. It was challenging, as I mentioned, but we uh, received startup support from some angels and strong support from the clinical community. And the fact faculty worked for less than minimum wage given the hours we put in. Um, and, uh, and we're clearly committed to the project and we're driven by our belief in the importance of the Institute as a profession. And uh, thank you for listening to Old People Reminisce. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Tom. It has been fascinating. Um, now, moving ahead, um, all our panelists are going to talk about their hopes and dreams for ICSW moving forward. Uh, Joe, would you like to start? Sure. Well, first of all, it's really wonderful to hear and to have my memory jog of things that I have completely forgotten, <laughs> and some of which are probably made up. But <laughs> <laughs> the myth of how we got to this institute founded and uh, make it a reality it is beyond belief. I mean, the fact that pieces could come together as they did and uh, you know, problems, uh, overwhelming ones sometimes, uh, permitted us still to, to continue. But I think uh, Michelle was challenging us to share what our vision of the Institute for the future would be? What would it, our hopes and dreams be for the Institute? Um, I, I think I would have to get a committee together and meet again in that basement in order to really answer that question and see which way to go. <laughs> but one of the ideas would be uh, for ICSW, uh, to be to move to a university model, to expand our vision beyond being quote an institute, to perhaps finding a way for us to become a university, and what this implies would be to have enough financial backing, not only to have the wonderful administrative structure we now have, and, and uh, the committed people that have been leading the Institute for all these years, but also to have a, a full-time faculty, to be able to have the luxury of uh, uh, asking for research grants and having uh, the, the personnel to be able to do research in our field. Uh, in addition, uh, one of the things that concerns me considerably uh, is, uh, for example, uh, the lack of a, a specialty in work with children. Unfortunately, the Chicago Analytics Institute has phased out its program. And now there is no program in the Chicago area to educate uh, clinicians in working with children, something that is very close to my heart since I'm uh, primarily a child therapist. In addition to having a sequence for children, uh, I think uh, in such a university setting, there would be a, a department dealing with trauma. Uh, trauma is a big issue in our field nowadays, not only in terms of the developments that have occurred in our understanding of what uh, impact it has on brain development, but also on the ways to address 
uh, the, the fallout of people who are uh, affected by trauma, both in early years and also in later years. So such a department would be wonderful. Another one uh, would be a department uh, with staffed with faculty to begin to address how clinicians could reach out to underserved communities. Uh, we as private practitioners uh, forget that many, many people cannot afford our fees, even with the insurance reimbursement. And, and what we need is to find ways to uh, uh, allow us to provide services for communities that badly need uh, mental health access and do not have it so far. There are many others uh, in, in such an expanded uh, institution. And uh, I, I, I would uh, uh, very much uh, wish it could happen uh, in my own lifetime and uh, hope that we can make it happen. That's my dream. Thank you, Joe. It's wonderful to um, have your vision and your ideas and uh, many people who will put their nose to the grindstone and work on these with you. Thank you. Uh, Louise. Uh, well, I, I'm with Joe and, and hoping for all these things, but one of the things I wanted to emphasize is that I've been just very pleased to see our graduates taking leadership roles in social agencies and in applying our psychoanalytic understanding to the extremely difficult inner city problems that we have today. And uh, I want to see the Institute continue this and, of course, expand our understanding of how to deal with trauma and all the, the you know, incredibly difficult problems that we face today. Yes, thank you. And uh, COVID has certainly added to the complications. Yes, thank you. Um, Ellen. Thank you. Well, I'm, I think I'm, uh, a little bit overwhelmed, Joe, by your 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 vision. Um, so, um, but then I think um, you know who would have thought forty years ago that when that we would be in this place. Um, so I have to think about it all, especially the becoming a university that seems daunting. Um, but I I am. Um, I would like to, one of the things that I would love to see more of uh, would be institute community partnerships that provide an opportunity to tackle some of, some of the really serious problems we have in the Chicago area and nationwide in terms of, and to be able to provide services and to be able to do research. And I think the, the, the potential for contribution to knowledge is really huge. Um, so I, I, would, I would love to see more of that. Um, and I, as I was going through um, the enormous number of dissertations that have been done since we opened our doors and had our first graduates, um, that and I know some, some graduates and students have published and certainly are presenting in conferences and out there. I would love to see more um, publication and not only in professional journals, but also in, in, in the press in general, because I think there's applicability to that, that can be useful to people's everyday lives. And I would love to see that bridge being made more and more. Um, I think that's, I, I think I'll stop there. Um, okay. These are wonderful ideas that all of you are presenting and uh, many that I hope will come to fruition. Uh, Connie. Let well, you know, 
Ah, oh, the more I hear all of you speak, uh, the more I realize I agree with everything. <laughs> uh, that there's not a thing to disagree with. And I think you've covered so much ground in terms of how we might move forward. And I think, Joe, the idea of a university is, is very compelling <laughs> to me. I, I think that on the one hand, I mean, this is one part of what I think is important, is that there's a, there's a need for understanding as fully as we can, for lack of a better word, the sort of the intellectual underpinnings of what we do, um, as they may uh, be expressed in terms of philosophy and other fields that we might, if, if we had our druthers, it would be great to be able to focus more on uh, issues such as uh, the philosophical underpinnings of what we do. Uh, now I realize that's not appealing to everyone. It has a certain appeal for me, but it, it, it's, it is, I think, a part of what would ground our work uh, more fully, that we are, we are practitioners and so forth, but we also need to kind of keep a hold of and keep exploring what it is that grounds us uh, in terms of uh, our uh, um, understanding of what we do intellectually and so on. No, that, that's kind of over there. Um, the other thing that's very much on my mind, and I'm sure on the minds of all of you, is that in the, just the last few days, it is incredibly discouraging what is happening in terms of violence in our community. And at, just in the last few days, horrifying episodes in the Hyde Park area, which is an area that I grew up in and know very well. It, I am incredibly, as I know others are, but just bewildered by the lack of society's capacity to truly engage what these difficulties are and how we might um, address them. All I can say is that we need to keep our shoulder to the wheel about these kinds of problems and what we can do clinically, both after the fact uh, with regard to violence, but what can be done in a more preventative way. So it, these are not new things, but I would just hope we would continue on in our concern about. Thank you so much, Connie. Um, Tom. Uh, ditto. <laughs> well, I'll say just a little bit more. Um, two things that, that, that I thought about that are incorporated in what other people have said. Uh, I don't know where the Institute is with incorporating anti-oppressive and anti-racist uh, focus and philosophy. I, I do believe, you know, my experience post-Institute with the Chicago State University and now with Loyola, uh, th these organizations, these institutions are, are grappling very actively with these issues. And I think I, I'm hoping that the Institute is doing that. And if not, it should be. <laughs> uh, I just don't, I don't know what, you, what you've done there. And the other uh, element is uh, research. I, I think the, there, as Ellen said, there's a lot of dissertations floating around and the, from those dissertations and from work on top of those that people could be doing, uh, I do believe that the Institute has the potential to be a, a, a center for cl clinical research, which is badly needed and is beginning to develop in the last few years. Um, and I agree with everything everybody else has said. Thank you. Um, any other comments, additions after you've heard each other? Well, as chair of the board, Freddie, go ahead and raise the money to have our dreams come true. <laughs> yeah, absolutely my intention. And I'm listening very carefully and writing down um, your ideas, your, your hopes, your aspirations um, as uh, as a chair of the board and members of the board, we are always um, uh, identifying goals, listening to uh, the ICSW community,
for their hopes and dreams. And these are tremendously helpful, um, exciting ideas, which we will definitely discuss at our next board meeting. Um, this coming Monday and in many future ones. So rest assured that uh, these suggestions will be very much heard and um, paid attention to. And to Tom's question um, about what ICSW is doing about um, anti-oppression, anti-racism, um, ICSW is doing a lot. Much has been spearheaded by our president Dr. Stewart, um, there is a committee uh, she works very closely with, um, the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committee um, to develop programs. There's been a, quite a few staff workshops and trainings um, to raise consciousness and to help uh, faculty deal with issues within the student community and in the classroom. Um, the board is constantly talking about ways to support uh, the administration and faculty and looking for funding sources that can help us advance some of these programs. So that uh, is definitely front and center. Good to hear, beautiful. And in terms of dealing with um, underserved populations, um, actually at the coming board meeting, we have a student presenting um, a clinical case. I'm very excited about this. Um, her work with a homeless man who spent many years living under a bridge and with whom she worked through an agency in the community. And, um, she will be talking about how she applies psychodynamic psychotherapy work with Excellent. this man and similar populations. So right to the heart of some of the things that you're talking about. Great. Thank you. Um, so uh, we would like to invite those who have questions, comments, to uh, type them in and we will have our panelists address them. So Dr. Stewart has invited those who are interested to now turn on your cameras as we move into the Q&A. Uh, I have a question for the panelists. Um, yes. So social justice is listed as one of ICSW's values. How did you view that values as being realized through the PhD program? Um, is there? I think maybe I can uh, begin to address that. Uh, I think you have to put in context uh, our generation and the issues that uh, concerned us when we founded the Institute, uh, we were sort of uh, the visionaries at the time. But what social work was about there was uh, 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 divided between, uh, you know, uh, social work and clinical social work. And clinicians uh, were pushing more for an identity that led to um, private practice and the model of private practice. In fact, most of the early uh, students, although affiliated with agencies, also had the private practice. So the, the, the issue of uh, racism, social justice, were not as 
prominent at the time. Uh, what concerned us more was uh, severe mental health. Uh, one of the categories we struggled with was personality disorders, uh, borderline personality disorders. I taught uh, for years uh, a course on borderline personality disorders. Uh, so psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic therapy as it was conceived then uh, was difficult to apply to some of the other populations. And it was more, uh, I hate to say this, but I think more uh, serving the middle and upper class than it was. Uh, and social workers were certainly involved in other areas, but not, not as much. Um, and maybe some of you, the others, uh, Tom and Ellen might fill in a little bit more. Well, I, th I think you accurately described the context and I think that's, that's the answer to the question. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't front and center like it is now. Right. Yeah, and, and I think we were so um, concerned about losing a perspective that the field was going to move away from this uh, more psychodynamic perspective. And we were wanting to um, develop it, hold on to it. Um, and um, I, th I think it was, it was hard in that moment to have the balance uh, that we that we needed, um, and I'm not even sure that we use the term um, social justice then. Um, and so, not that we weren't concerned with social justice, we certainly were. It was a, it's a founding principle, but I'm not sure that was the term we were using. Did, no, I, th I think it, this was an era when we were um, advocating for ourselves uh, and gaining status, gaining independence from, from uh, folks who uh, were over us. Um, there's a great book that I think represents the a critique of that era. I can't remember the author's names, but it, the title of the book is Unfaithful Angels. And it's a description of how social work has abandon the poor, abandon oppressed people. And it was a, it was a uh, cry to come back to, to its social work's roots, which I think has happened in the field in general um, today. But I, I remember our students who worked in social agencies using their dynamic understanding. Uh, an example would be, uh, the Scholarship and Guidance Association, which is now SGA, uh, I don't remember the title, but uh, uh, one of our graduates became the, the executive director and they have programs of uh, in the city schools using groups but to, to help very underprivileged kids. Uh, using everything they know in psychodynamic theory. So I don't think we abandoned uh, the, the, the needs. And uh, you can f work for social justice in many ways. The other thing that was more of a focus for, in terms of uh, at least how I conceive, when Arnie and I met, the concern was that with the hostility towards psychodynamic thinking in the social work schools, the faculties there were being decimated and uh, the uh, number of courses being taught uh, were markedly reduced. And so what we feared was that a modality that we knew was effective in, in, in dealing with mental illness and uh, people with emotional problems was being seriously neglected. Uh, you know, was, uh, behavioral approaches were being touted as uh, sort of 
uh, more effective than uh, talk therapy and uh, a, you know, a number of other. Um, so the goal as, uh, as Arnie and I were conceived was that we would educate uh, a level, a cadre of people who could then go back and become teachers and professors in universities. And so as to bolster then that element. And so that, that was really the, uh, the focus of what at least uh, Arnie and I conceived at the beginning. Now it changed a little bit. Um, so it was elevating the whole profession by PhD, but also making that possible to enter into academia. Whereas master's level people were no longer uh, able to uh, certainly get positions in academic settings. Uh, you had to have your PhD. And then once you had your PhD, what we hoped would be um, a re-entry into academia to change the culture again. Thank you for, for answering. Uh, before raising the next question, uh, I would like to acknowledge Myr Myrna Ornstein. Uh, thank you all in the chat for the wonderful education regarding the work involved in the evolution of this wonderful institution. Um, and there is another question um, from a member of the Pioneer class. Um, uh, he would see, uh, he would ask, he would like to ask if you would see thinking about aging as an interest and attention for ICSW. Uh, yeah, and then I think we have time for one last question from Carol Goldbaum. Goldbaum, excuse me. Well, you have uh, just... Connie Goldberg speaking. You have a lot of aging people right here on the panel, <laughs> so we constitute a, a knowledge base right here. I, I, it would seem to me that over time, what I've heard is that there is an increasing interest in and responsiveness to issues um, of aging. Uh, I, you know, the institute is such a complicated place because it becomes the nexus of so many concerns. <laughs> Uh, of diversity of issues such as aging, of ca taking care of and being responsive to children and so forth. It always seems to me at the Institute that there is there are people who are pushing forward in all of these areas. I don't think anything is being neglected. Part of it has to do with a matter of resources, just you know, do we have enough teachers, do we have enough finances, uh, et cetera, to um, be responsive to all of this. But one of the things I've always found about the Institute is that there is a willingness to go into difficult areas. Um, we just need, at, at times, let me just say this also, I, at times we need being pushed by our students. And I found that when I was teaching, that, it, that, that it's very important that, that students feel they can say, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? What about diversity? What about aging? And it's very important for the Institute to remain um, open to those concerns. It, my experience was when I was teaching there for many, many years was that I was bombarded by people saying, well, yeah, but you haven't paid enough attention to this and you need to and so forth. Um, and a, an attempt to try to be responsive. Um, a, a willingness, we, we're, we're always, we're not always great at that at the Institute. I think we have to say that. Um, we, may, we may not be, but I think the, the willingness is there. Thank you. Um... If I can interject something which um, is close to my heart, and that is um, uh, the centers that, 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 that's named after me that deals with neuroscience and psychoanalytic social work. Um, it, it's very gratifying to know uh, that that center is a part of ICSW and has a contribution to make in terms of bringing a body of knowledge uh, into practice that for many years, we as social workers sort of were excluded from. 
you know, psychodynamic thinking uh, did not consider uh, issues of brain function and dysfunction as sort of part of uh, their knowledge base, primarily because uh, the education of social workers simply did not include that kind of material. And, and so now uh, there is also this opportunity uh, to appreciate uh, the uh, power that this body of knowledge, neuroscience, understanding brain function brings, uh, in particular applied to trauma and the knowledge that we have about the brain changes that occur as a result of trauma. But more extended to, to that, uh, the, the effect of uh, uh, poverty, the effect of, uh, of child abuse, uh, the effect of uh, you know, um, environmental factors that affect children's brain development. Uh, these are all areas that are critically need to be addressed also uh, because you know, those children are gonna grow up and have problems that we will then have to deal with and that are harder to uh, address because of the damage that's caused uh, by early environmental issues. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Those are very important issues as well. Uh, now I would like to invite Mrs. Goldbaum to raise her, raise the last question for the session. Am I on now? Yes. Okay. Um, a couple of things. I really, having lived through this period, I didn't know half of what you all have taught me today. And, you know, the agony and the, and the determination has just been wonderful to hear in more detail about. Um, I also, for the person who asked about DEI, uh, I've been through several DEI trainings and the one at ICSW for, for the board was absolutely the best I've been through. And I would highly recommend that, that we share more of that with the rest of our community. Um, and I'm just amazed at the perseverance of this core group. And I know most of you. I, one other last comment, which is that I think the schools of social work never learned how to integrate different ways of practicing to serve all the, the whole client. And I think that's what Joe was just talking about in terms of brain knowledge versus, you know, both traditional psychodynamic psychotherapy. And that's such a loss for our field. And I'm so grateful that the Institute is around. Thank you all. There was just a follow-up question. Um, what is DEI training? Could someone specify for, for the listeners? It, it's uh, the Go ahead. It's uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and um, includes training about uh, dealing with um, uh, unconscious racial bias, um, and many of the issues that are front and center in the news these days around um, unconscious racism. Yeah. And making sure that we no longer keep all those barriers between us. So thank you. Bye. Thank you. I would just like to add to the question about aging. Um, Carol Goldbaum, who just spoke, is a member of our board and um, a very active uh, social work professional in the community, particularly in the area of aging. Um, and she has lots and lots of connections with community agencies, which um, is something the board will continue to develop and nurture. Um, and then there's a trickle down effect on uh, the impact on uh, the students, the faculty, the administration, and the board members. So I think we are at the end of uh, our time for this panel discussion. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you during the next three parts of this program. Um, we'll be hearing from alumni 
and then faculty and then current students who will be able to answer your questions from many different perspectives. Thank so, you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. As everyone heard, our founders are still visionaries. Many thanks to our founders. And thank you, Dr. Friedman, for lead, leading such a lively panel discussion. Now I want to invite our alumni panel to turn on their cameras and to turn on their mics. Again, we'll ask everyone who is not presenting now to turn off their cameras and to turn off their mics. Dr. Leah Harp, who's an alumna and also chair of the ICSW Alumni Committee, will serve as moderator for the alumni panel. Dr. Harp, the virtual floor is yours. Good afternoon, everybody, and greetings from Minneapolis. Speaking of justice, equity, inclusion, and social justice issues. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today with my other committee members. We are missing two, Carrie Torgerson, who's also a faculty member and an alumni, uh, is dealing with a family situation. And one of our other new committee members,